Hi guys, please like, share and subscribe and contact this number if you want lectures related to any CM, CS or CB subjects. Thank you. Hello and welcome guys. So today for the second episode of the actual podcast, I have with me Mr. Sumit Ramani, who is a fellow of both uh, Institute and Faculty of Actuaries and Institute of Actuaries of India. He is a non-traditional consulting actuary and he runs his own uh, consulting firm, Actuaria Consultants. Uh, he has been uh, with uh, very big names in the past, including Swiss Re and Kotak Life. And uh, right now, he uh, he he has uh, been uh, doing well on his entrepreneurial journey. He has a, a, another startup called as Protect Me Well, which is an online platform uh, which helps people choose uh, uh, like the right sort of insurance uh, coverage that they should take and the sort of policies that uh, they need to take. Also, he's uh, the chief actuary at Fidentia X. So, uh, yeah, Sumit uh, ha- is one guy who is doing a lot of cool work in this area. And uh, that's actually, uh, you know, he's, he's one of those guys who's uh, really inspiring, uh, like for a lot of us uh, uh, in the actuarial domain, uh, for someone to just uh, step out of the traditional role is actually uh, rare still in, uh, in the profession. And, and uh, that's actually really admirable for me. And I had spoken to Sumit uh, uh, about four years back. I did a very similar session, which is uh, still on my uh, YouTube channel. And it's the video which has gotten the most number of views. It, it has 9,000 views now. Wow. So, so yeah, so I thought it would be a really good idea to uh, speak to Sumit again and, uh, you know, just uh, see that how things have evolved and uh, how uh, he feels about the profession and things in general now. Right. So, uh, yeah, Sumit, uh, uh, so how, how has the journey been since we last spoke? Like, it's been four, four years. Yeah, since we last spoke, I think things have changed a lot. And I've learned a lot, uh, gained a lot, both uh, in terms of uh, knowledge, uh, in terms of visibility, and there has been obviously a fair amount of uh, financial benefits over a period of time because of being on my own and working with clients across the globe. Um, when we spoke, I had just started, I think, it, and it was a month uh, since I had started on my own. And I was already working on a client project then. Uh, since then, uh, I've spoken at several conferences, uh, worked, on, uh, worked with clients pretty much across the globe. So I can now boast of clients in five continents and have wow. over 30 at over 30 or client clients i have worked with not all of them i'm working with current with them currently but i've worked about with 30 or clients so, and all of it has been super exciting work right i mean and the beauty and the beauty of everything that i've done is while where i have applied my skills are fairly non traditional uh, areas but uh, the skill, uh, but the good part is that the skills that I learned over doing the regular traditional job at insurer and reinsurer was being applied in different settings. So in terms of skills, uh, I kind of re, uh, utilized what I already knew, but applied in a new setting. And of course, now I've been, I'm also pursuing a fairly rigorous course on machine learning, uh, which uh, where and I've already spent good six months and also working on uh, an assignment wherein I'm using machine learning techniques to estimate the depreciated value of car uh, and the car uh, based on certain inputs. So yeah, uh, fairly exciting. The team is also growing. Uh, now, while I work with a pool of resources over a period of uh, throughout last three, four years, I've also identified someone who is going to work with me full time, fairly senior resource, uh, nearly qualified, I would say. Uh, that has been on the consulting side, uh, and equally, as you mentioned, on Protect Me Well, which is a comprehensive insurance need analyzer, uh, is what we launched uh, last year, has been uh, getting fair, uh, generating fair amount of interest, and now we are in a situation to launch it for US as well. Okay, so so far you have just been yeah. operating in India with that, is it? Yeah, so it it was for so. Uh, the need analysis or insha- uh, or the financial profiling of an individual is, is very specific to where he or she lives, mm-hmm. right? Because uh, uh, what he earns, the rate, the rate at which he earns, the inflation, 
the interest rate, all are a function of where uh, of the geography, right? But the the way we design algorithm, the algorithm doesn't need to be changed. It is a very very comprehensive and flexible algorithm. But when let's say when we are moving to US, all we need to do is add parameters which are specific to US, which means a lot of research but no coding. Hmm. So you have a certain proof of concept now, and then now you can yeah. scale up to now, uh, yeah. newer markets. So, newer right. markets which would only mean doing a lot of research to be able to find out those parameters which are appropriate for the market doing testing whether it whether the results make sense or not but right. no for the coding which is the beauty of what what you've done right, right. Uh, equally we've done uh, strategic collaborations with uh, a chatbot company so now you can take a pro- take the entire protect well journey while talking to a chatbot either through text or through voice okay uh, also that's, that's very interesting uh, yeah, I also partnered with another uh, another strategic partner who uh, help in India helps insurance brokers get uh, sell our policies online very very quickly. So they have integrated APIs with insurer of insurer, and whenever a broker wants to sell policies online, they can use uh, their AP- APIs or wrapper around them. Right now, Protect Me Well sits in their API stack. Okay, so, so if a broker essentially, wants, uh, essentially yeah. your services can be accessed via the uh, insurance broker's website, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. If they wish, they work. Yeah, yeah. You you do the advisory and sort of like uh, you know consulting part of it for the uh, uh, the client, and then they are the ones who are offering the options, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is really the first step of buying insurance, right? To know what is that you need. Right. And once you've figured out the the remaining part is of course to buy what you need, right? Right. So we are really touching the or uh, adding value in the very first step of insurance buying journey. Mm. So like four years ago, we uh, I I don't know if you remember this or not. I had asked you a question that uh, whether actuaries work will be replaced by. Uh, you know, uh, machines and artificial intelligence or not. But then now uh, the kind of product you have created, you mm-hmm. have sort of uh, automated the work of an insurance agent, right? In a lot yeah, of- Yeah, I mean, because- partly yes, partly yes, yes. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that-, that- and, and that would continue to happen, right? I mean, every, every job that can be automated will get automated. Every job wherein data could add a lot of value and which is, which requires huge calculations or running several rules in one go will get automated. So, uh, and we'll probably talk about it in the, during the podcast, uh, but slowly and gradually, uh, things would start getting automated and only way to stay in the game is up your game, right? Move up right. the ladder chain so that the repetitive task that you're doing is done by someone else, which frees up your time to upskill and do something more meaningful. Right. But but let me just uh, pose a further question on that. So the role of uh, an insurance agent traditionally, as we have seen it in yeah. India, it's a very sort of yeah. personalized role, right? Uh, yeah. The client maintains a very personal relationship with the insurance yeah. agent and they keep in regular touch, right? Uh, but yeah. with a tech like yours, how, how are yeah. you able to compensate for that? Because I, I think yeah. at some level that would be a challenge, right? That sort of engagement. Yeah. Yeah. So in India or uh, pretty much across the globe, insurance would have need, would need to have a human touch. What we are, and would by and large be sold through uh, agents or human beings. Uh, yes, the more sophisticated ones who don't want to talk to human beings would do it online. But <laughs> there would be a chunk of people, a fair majority of people, who would buy through an agent. Right? Doing is enabling everyone to identify their insurance needs. Right. Uh, whether you choose to buy yourself or through an agent is still quite open to you. Right. But what you need to know is whether I need a term insurance of one crore or two crore or five crores. Uh, when I retire, should I have a retirement corpus of five crores, 10 crores, 15 crores? Hmm. Uh, do I need a, a medical insurance of five lakhs or 10 lakhs or 15 lakhs? Given I have a family of certain size, I earn some certain amount. Uh, and what should be the size of my, let's say, critical illness cover, right? If I ask people now, they won't even, I mean, they might have an answer, but that may or may not be a scientifically backed answer. Right. What we're doing is enabling people to identify their needs and then letting them decide how they wish to buy. Right, right, right. So you're, you're bringing in a lot of expertise in terms of what you've yeah. learned as an actuary in order to right. how people should personally evaluate their insurance requirements. 
right exactly that's, that's actually great that's great so uh, like uh, just to get uh, the first uh, question so uh, you have worked in a couple of uh, different settings right you have worked yeah. in uh, uh, a kpo sort of setup with swiss re you have worked yeah. in uh, kotak life where it was a core insurance company and now you're yeah. an entrepreneur for almost 4 years yeah. so uh, yeah. walk me through how uh, does the experience differ and like what are the different challenges w- which come in in each of the uh, sort of uh, you know setup and uh, like how does the experience differ yeah i mean the experience is certainly different uh, and if i look at it now uh, uh, and of course the challenges are different so when i was uh, with a direct insurer uh it, everything that i did was fairly regulatory right so everything that i did would uh, would go through a, uh so i was in the pricing team so every product that is uh, before it is launched it is approved by a regulator right so a lot of it that you do is uh was regulatory in nature in that sense right so um, it require a different type of rigor and also um a different uh, i would say let me put it a very different a uh, skill set in terms of being able to be 100% right or near 100% right which is what you expect from actuaries in in any way but what it also means that if you want to be 100% right there's little room in terms of what you could do new let's say uh, if i were to uh, say i am pricing a product which is based on let's say credit score of the individual i do not know uh, the, your health conditions but i know your credit score can i do it without taking a risk right uh, without taking a, a risk that okay this could go wrong my uh, algorithms could fail my algorithms could generate a value which is not reliable and different from reality but am i willing to take that risk while this exa- uh, while i'm quoting this example this is already being done in india and overseas right but before it could get to a point where someone thought about it and did it it took several years right? so what so you're telling me that, is that mm-hmm. the scope of innovation is fairly limited in that uh, area because they- it, it, yeah it, it is not limited it the entire journey is very slow the from step yeah. from from the point of being uh, ideating and to execute it it takes a while and there is it there is it is for a reason right i'm not trying to uh say that this is this is not how it should be done because mm-hmm. when it's, when you and i buy policies from an insurance companies we are placing a lot of trust on them i mean there's no point me buying a term insurance if the claims cannot be paid right when the time comes and that could only happen when insurance companies work in a very structured neat way where, wherein they ensure that the models are fairly accurate they know details to the last level of they know information to the last level of detail they make the right provisions and not play around with it right and not being innovative with what you provision <laughs> so yeah so it it is it 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 has to be run in a certain way and that's that's essentially how it would be right. for next several years there would be innovations but may not necessarily be in how you price product but maybe how you onboard a customer how you underwrite how you pay the claims uh and maybe start using new parameters like you already see in vehicle telematics right so right. we using new parameters but vehicle telematics is something which has, which we talking since last 20 odd years already right so it it took a while before and it's still not mainstream hmm. right sure sure so uh, you told me that yeah. you've worked in like five continents right so how yeah. is the experience while still of, sitting in india while still sitting in india of course mm-hmm. but you're getting yeah. work yeah. from a lot of uh, yeah. continents yeah. and then you're pricing yeah. products which are going to be implemented in different uh, locations right so the quality of uh, like data uh, that is one mm-hmm. that that is something mm-hmm. i want to address this from uh, mm-hmm. uh, that perspective that in mm-hmm. india the quality of data that you must get how does it differ from that you have abroad and then in general the kind of work that you have and the kind of uh, products that you work with is it very different yeah. in india and the developed world yeah so uh, uh, while i worked in five uh, client for clients in five continents my work uh, in the role of consultant has been fairly non regulatory in nature so there have been very few instances where i would have done which is 
closer to pricing a product and not really pricing it. Uh, while I've, uh, uh, yeah, so what I've done is fairly non-regulatory in nature, just to clarify that bit. To so address your point around data, right? So uh, let me take an example. While there are good examples in uh, in my consulting room assignments, the very good examples are also what we see in Protect Me Well, right? So uh, in uh, when we let's say one of the things that we try and find out uh, or estimate uh, as part of Protect Me Well is how much you spend. Right. I mean, that, that's that determines how much, uh, for example, in, in context of term insurance, your expenses now and future is what you need to cover be covered for. Right. Basically, the expenses of your expenses, your, uh, your family's expenses and outstanding loans is what you should be covered for. Right. Uh, and there's no easy way to identify it. But in a US setting, I can do it at a pin code level. There's tons of information where you tell me what is your pin code and with fair degree of accuracy, I can tell you what, what would be the size of your home, what your, would be your expenses look, what your, your expenses look like under various heads. In India, uh, things change from one street to another. Right, and you add, and that's fair, right? Nothing wrong in it but you, you do not have easy way to find it. For example, uh, um, the stock example is Bandra West is very different from Bandra East, right? Uh, but you don't have uh, reliable information to be, tell, uh, to be able to tell how different Bandra West is different from Bandra East or quantify it. Something like that is, is available in US market. Right, so you, right. Yeah, so when you work with data, which is fairly detailed, you're a lot more confident about what you're doing. Uh, and hence your results are fairly reliable. Equally, right? I mean, when I was at with Switch3, uh, so in Indian setting, when you're pricing a life insurance product, uh, the rating factors that you use is largely, right? Broadly age, gender, and smoker status, right? When I was at Switch3, I was reviewing a model, uh, a mortality, a model which is used for pricing term insurance in US. It had 25 parameters. Okay, right. So and, and because you have changes yeah. the level of complication and the accuracy many yeah. fold. Right? Yeah, Correct. yeah. It also means that I mean it, uh, your model becomes a lot more complex, but it all it also means that you have data at a very very granular level. You right. could price things based uh, on I mean social status is one of the very important factor, right? It would be factored in India as well, but we do not have that granular data. And I mean, uh, the point is we'll get there. It will take a few years to be able to get there. Right. So wh while we are talking about India in particular, uh, so mm. if you look at the Indian life insurance market, which is uh, something I think you have your work for a while in, yeah. Uh, yeah. there is a big, uh, you know, a government company, a mammoth in terms mm. of LIC, mm. which, which controls yeah. a huge chunk of the market and a very yeah. small portion of the market is left to the private players. Like in India, uh, until it, at least uh, five, mm. 10 years ago. And even now people uh, mm. use the word LIC when they uh, want to refer to life insurance. They're like, mm. Aapne LIC le rakhi hai kya? Malab, that sort of uh, a phrase, right, yeah. phrase work, right? Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. Uh, synonymous. So uh, with that sort of a big player with such deep pockets in the market and, you know, mm. uh, such a huge reach, uh, where mm. do you see the Indian life insurance, uh, 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 domain uh, going and also how does the presence of such a big uh, PSU affect the market in your opinion? I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, regardless of uh, uh, the so many players that we already have, right? India is still very, very underpenetrated. So what you could do is, is a lot more than what has already been done. So in my mind, there's a lot of scope of, a uh, uh, lot of scope, uh, there's a lot that can be done in life insurance setting. Uh, there's a lot that needs to do to be done in increasing insurance penetration, right? Uh, so while uh, we're talking about like penetration of what sub 10% uh, essentially, I mean, I'm not updated with recent numbers, but it's certainly sub 10. And in most developed markets, it will be 50, 60 odd percent, right? So there's a lot that needs to be done. The advantage of LIC uh, is that people started knowing about insurance when the LIC started, right? And when the new players come came in, people knew what insurance is. I mean, 
had a had heard the term what insurance is, right? So in a way, the presence of uh, LIC has only helped. Uh, that's how I see it. Right, right. Of course, I mean, uh, there's various factors that come into play, especially when you go to tier two or tier three cities. Uh, but presence of uh, insurance players like LIC has certainly helped the market and would continue to help. Right. Uh, so and there would still be still be room for uh, private payers to uh, add value in the country in terms of yeah, because, increasing because the, or of the decreasing the protection gap still still not uh, covered right Correct. covered yeah so uh, how how has covid 19 affected you in, in terms of your work and your life uh, uh, has there been much impact yeah uh, i mean um, in terms of my work uh, there hasn't been much impact uh, i've been uh, my hands were full throughout uh, so it, it did not impact me and I was lucky, I must say. Uh, but what we also, uh, what I also uh, did, two important things that I did, I, uh, I enhanced my skill around asynchronous communication. So since I work with people, with clients across the globe, uh, I have a pool of resources which are based wherever and they are freelancers themselves, right? So they would, they, I don't know when they would be available. So. The traditional way would have been to pick up a phone and reach out to them and speak to them, right? But uh, they might, chances are they are busy with something else. So how do you ensure that you continue to uh, rely on resources while still not rely on real-time communication? Right? How do you uh, send uh, more complete messages over Slack so that you don't get a follow-up question in response, but you get an answer that you're looking for? Right. So that's one skill I've been trying to up my game there. So uh, asynchronous communication is where I've been trying to uh, aware, uh, which which improved over a period of time. So if I were to, let's say, send a message, uh, I'll just send a message. I'll, and sh I'll I now uh, consciously ask myself, do I need to make a call or can I do something uh, asynchronously? If I were to explain something in detail, I'll record a video and, and send it over. If I were to show something in a in a particular web page, let's say I would just take a screenshot, uh, identify that particular page, write text over it, and send it over. And this is exactly how entire Protect Me Well was built. It was built during COVID times. So a part of my team I haven't even met even now. Okay. But it also means that uh, demonstrates that we could do something remotely and something which is fairly credible, reliable, and as robust as Protect Me Well is. Right. Uh, in terms of in uh, personally, uh, it also uh, I mean there was uh, during the time I also realized that what I've been doing throughout since I started on my own has been fairly location agnostic. Uh, I have a very few clients in India, and if they are, they are mostly based out of uh, Mumbai, and I was based of Bangalore, based out of Bangalore, right? So I was anyways not physically present to meet them. And rest of my clients were spread across globally. So I, I did not meet them on a regular basis, if at all, if I've met them. And Protect Me Well was entirely done remotely. Right? So that made me wonder, is there any reason why I should still be living in Bangalore, uh, away from my family, uh, my parents, uh, and also uh, spending a fair amount on things that I spend on, right? So. Uh, uh, after careful consideration, doing a pilot of uh, living for 100 days in Bilai, I moved to Bilai two months ago. So now I am based okay. out of Bilai, uh, uh, working from here. It, ha it has not changed anything that I've been doing. And until uh, uh, things open up, right, I will be here. And when things open up, I'll travel more frequently, but this is now my base location. So that's, that's, that's a huge that's impact great. of COVID. That's interesting yeah. like of uh, you know uh, yeah. being able to work out of a tier two or tier yeah. three city that that has actually yeah. become possible and we have realized that yeah. it is doable i i mean without uh, the pandemic and without the lockdowns we would have probably never even thought about it right? yeah that thought so, wouldn't have come in yeah yeah so in my mind it was always there but it was also the perception around who i deal with right so if uh, now people are open to the eye for protect me well nobody has told me let's meet and ha have a discussion right when i was um, uh, and in in the consulting setting people said okay Delhi, <laughs> so i now people are open to the idea of doing a video call and having a, a critical conversations or important conversations over video call right
right? So the the perception around uh, across the globe has changed, which has enabled, which made this decision a lot more easier. This also means that now I'm uh, my monthly expenses are taken care by my financial assets, which gives me a lot more uh, uh, room to experiment. So now I'm in a position to hire someone who is full time, who is fairly senior so that I could do more because I'm no longer worried about my expenses. They're already taken care of. Right, right. So that's that's on the personal and the professional side. But how do you think insurance, life and health insurance has been impacted by the pandemic? Because uh, I, I believe that because of the coming in of the pandemic and the medical costs that would have been disproportionately affected because of this, the life insurance costs that would have been disproportionately affected, uh, are they being taken into account now? And uh, like going uh, in the future, uh, pandemics look like a very real risk in the you know heads of human yeah. beings now. So uh, has that changed uh, things? Did you see some impact? Yeah. So uh, I think in the first wave, um, life insurance wasn't really impacted because uh, there weren't many deaths, right? And health insurance had an interesting impact wherein uh, OPDs were pretty much closed. Nobody visited hospital for small little things. Uh, people who could delay their surgeries delayed it. So I think the, the claims were also very less. Uh, the only claims that uh, health insurance companies experienced were largely around COVID. And those weren't much, at least the first phase. In the second, second uh, wave, uh, the deaths have increased and that has certainly impacted life insurance companies very, very directly. Now, if you uh, see, they've, uh, uh, they've also, uh, the insurance, the premiums have gone up, not just because of COVID, but it was in my mind, long due. Uh, term insurance rates were very, very competitive. So it was long due, COVID could just accelerated it. Uh, second, uh, now they're all, uh, I read in one of the policy contracts uh, that, or maybe I'm not 100% right, but we'll have to do a fact check. You're required to take va vaccine before an insurance company would be willing to offer you term insurance four doses of vaccine unless you're offered a term insurance. So that's, that's the level of impact COVID has had on life insurance side. Mm -hmm. uh, on uh, health insurance side, now you see all sides of all sorts of claims uh, and the health insurance claims would have also increased. I'm again, I'm not very close to it. So uh, the underwriting guidelines would certainly change. Like the vaccination would become part of the underwriting guideline. Uh, there might just be exclusions or waiting period for those who were uh, diagnosed with COVID uh, in past. And if uh, there are already products uh, which are uh, specific to COVID, and again, this is a, this is something one have to do when we'll have to do a fact check on. Not and up until last uh, last month, not many re, not many insurers were willing to renew Corona coverage and Raksha. Right, because, because there, there is, is a very, very direct risk here uh, in terms of uh, someone buying it and claiming it in, in the following week or in two weeks. Because pretty much, uh, uh, why, so everyone I spoke to had someone or else in the family who was impacted because of COVID, right? So that, that was a level of impact. Right, right. Right. And so, the last bit, really, uh, uh, when when the first wave started, I jacked up my uh, life insurance cover and medical cover uh, around at that, that time. And that's where Protect Me Well also came in handy. I saw, okay, I, now the Protect Me Well is ready. Let me do my analysis. And there was a huge gap, which I, on the term insurance side, there was a huge gap, which I already knew. So I jacked it up uh, just so that uh, if, let's say, if I'm not around, my family is covered. Uh, and this is exactly why people started uh, seeing value in protecting well as well, because people just did not know what is the right size of the cover. Right. right. So let me, uh, since you are in this business and uh, the kind of work that protect me well is doing, let me address mm -hmm. a separate question here. So what mm -hmm. I've personally seen in India is that mm -hmm. a lot of people look at life insurance as an investment product and not as a protection product, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Whenever you uh, uh, see the advertisements and the commercials of life insurance, they are always claiming the rates of returns. And, you know, uh, mm -hmm. endowment assurance sells much more than term assurance, uh, uh, as yeah. I think that's my perception of it, right? Yeah. So, like, do you think that attitude is slowly changing? And how has that shaped the insurance business in the country? 
over the past? Yes. Yeah, so I think uh, the attitude is uh, changing slightly, especially uh, amongst the most more financial savvy people. Uh, quite a few people now I talk to uh, aren't keen on buying endowment products. They are uh, they think it's, they are better off buying a term insurance and investing in mutual funds or equity or fixed deposit directly. So there has been an increase in awareness, uh, but I think there's still a lot of. Uh, a lot of business for insurance companies comes through a savings product. But in my mind, uh, it has gradually shifted uh, over, over in past. Now there is a fair amount of focus on term insurance and NET products uh, equally. Uh, and this, this will continue to increase. Uh, if you look at some of the listed companies and read their annual reports, they are very clear about increasing their focus around protection focused insurance. So uh, the next thing I would want to talk about is uh, uh, Fidentia X and uh, yeah. blockchain based tradable insurance, yeah. right? So yeah. uh, that sounded like a very interesting and appealing concept to yeah. me. So please yeah. uh, tell me like, uh, what are you guys exactly doing? And, and you yeah. are, are you one of the founders there or you're uh, just uh, like a consultant? Yeah. yeah. So uh, Fidentia started around uh, 2017 and it's, it's uh, I think, they're no longer very active in the operations and uh, my arrangement with them also uh, stopped uh, a year, year and a half ago. Uh, because they were, uh, in my head, I mean, the, the idea is nice and still novel and makes sense to me. Uh, struggled, the team struggled a lot uh, because of not being able to find right blockchain technology partners. Because uh, and that that it was early 2017, right? When blockchain, when people were still trying to figure out what blockchain is. Right. So uh, so trying uh, identifying partners who could develop a solution uh, was difficult, and a lot of money was spent into technology development, but the output wasn't quite delivered by the partners, and hence the team and the project suffered. So it's still it, it is on, but a very very in a very very dominant state. Right. But, but then just let's just talk about the product itself. How, how, yeah. uh, you know, how much potential do you see in uh, tradable insurance uh, platforms and yeah. what value uh, does blockchain add to it?